How are we doing guys? Billy Harris here and in today's video I'm going to be talking to you about optimizing the quality and method of your work. So here's what we're going to cover. Meaningful work, regulating blood sugar, intermittent fasting, work ergonomics and methods for working better, flow and your optimal experience of work and monitoring and measuring the work environment and ways of working. So as an analogy I'm going to refer to the ant or the pillar of the ecosystem, okay? So let's reference this quote first and foremost. Learn from the ants how a tiny heart, big enough to love, help and care about another living existence. So the ant is an archetype of an industrious worker. Similarly to how individuals in the online space or individuals who run their own business uh, like to keep themselves or refer to themselves as being martyrs and individuals that work 12 to 16 hours per day. They grind hard, they work hard, they don't have time for any other aspects of life like social life, for example. Okay? Worker ants gather food, clean the nest, care for the queen and generally oversee the functions of the colony. However, according to latest research, only 3% of worker ants work continuously and a quarter never ever work. And the same study also found that 70% of workers spend half the time idling, okay? Now, wise old ants know what they're doing. Work should not, be a con not only be a constant struggle, rather it should also involve controlled amounts of rest and relaxation. Now, this can be a key thing we're gonna take from this ecosystem here in regards to how we then move forward with our businesses as individuals in the online space, okay? Obviously then incorporating rest and relaxation into our protocols, into our systems, into our routines. So we're gonna to refer to meaningful work here and what exactly it is. Why is finding meaning in your work so significant? So enjoying or loathing one's daily work is of critical importance in terms of an individual's holistic well-being. So no matter how much you have a passion for your, your business or the variable of which you base your business upon, if you get to the point where you're working 12, 16 hour days, at that point there you will tend to then resent your business or the variable which you're working upon as I discussed earlier. So for example, in my hobby being music or my hobby being tennis, if I'm then to be on the tennis court for 12, 16 hour days per day, uh, 10, 10 hours days, um, I'm going to find that incredibly frustrating. I'm going to start to resent my sport, the thing that I love most, okay? Similar to how we can do the same thing with our businesses. Many entrepreneurs in the online space work under constant pressure to produce, grow and, uh, produce growth and development, causing more harm than good and often resulting in burnout where happiness levels are poor and stress levels are excessive. Now, predisposing factors for burnout include excessively high expectations of oneself and one's work, poor stress tolerance and coping mechanisms, as well as a strong sense of duty. Now, these being very prevalent in young individuals who are developing their own business, of course, individuals who follow individuals like Gary Vee, for example, and follow the concept of grinding hard and sleeping when they're dead, okay? Again, these being ridiculous concepts. So how do we evaluate how well you're coping with your workload and what method we should carry forward with that? So we should ask ourselves these questions when analyzing our workload and our method. How your work made you, cynical or critical? Do you find you have to drag yourself to work and it's hard to get the day started when you get there? Do your colleagues, customers or employers annoy you? Has your patience worn thin at work? Do you suffer from low level energies, uh, low, level, low energy levels at work? Do you find work disappointing? Do you use food, drugs or alcohol to feel better or to numb unpleasant feelings? Have you noticed changes in your sleeping patterns or appetite? And do you suffer from unexplained headaches, backaches or any other physiological ailments? Okay. So these assessments, these are questions you need to be asking yourself on a daily, weekly, monthly basis in regards to how you're coping with your workload and the method in terms of your daily routine. So we're going to establish a work manifesto for success here. And these are things I want you guys to refer to on a daily basis and a weekly basis and a monthly basis as well, moving forward. So establishing this manifesto for success. First and foremost, your work should be genuinely enjoyable and meaningful to you. If not, you'll experience a degree of burnout. Aim for self-directed freedom at work, for example, regarding working hours. Obviously, if you guys are working in the online space, you're able to do so. Seek a positive and supportive atmosphere and a pleasant work environment. And we'll, we'll talk about that later in regards to our work ergonomics and environment we de then develop for ourselves. Don't live to work, work to enrich your life. Quality over quantity, impact over efficiency. Allow yourself enough time for rest and recovery, particularly sleep. Take regular breaks and then use them to get up and move. So for example, in my work break blocks, what I tend to do is I actually have a basketball net in my flat in my apartment where I work. I also work at a standing desk, I'll refer to that later. Um, but at that point there, I then tend to then shoot some hoops and play some music for 10 minutes. I can't believe I just said shoot some hoops, but yes, I did say that. Um, and I tend to do that for 10 to 15 minutes in order to then have my work breaks as being efficient. Um, and then I get my heart rate up a little bit more so as well, okay? One half of your working time should be about producing an output, while the other half should be spent on input, making connections and learning new things. Research and select the best tools for repetitive tasks, or from there delegate that to another individual in your team or your environment, and pay attention to posture, ergonomics and working positions, okay? That being the key, I think, out of these 10 action items here. 
So what exactly should your desk or your working environment look like? Okay, now this is an awesome graphic to further develop this. And this is exactly what my, my kind of, my workspace looks like right now from where I'm recording this, okay? So you guys can assess this based off every variable included, in, including the green wall, water bottle, adjustable shoe changing lighting, uh, monitors at eye level. Also you can see there's double monitor there. I'll explain the reason as to why that is later. Natural light, ergonomic mouse, noise canceling headphones, indoor plants, vibration plates, massage balls, standing mats, adjustable desk, uh, standing desk, and then also a saddle chair. And again, these are all variables which you guys are potentially aware of in regards to setting yourself up for success with your work. But again, I'll dive into the reasons as to why that is at a latter point in this video. So physiological systems that affect the working day. So the main physiological mechanism affecting the stability and general state of alertness during the working day is the regulation of blood sugar. So many of you guys will have that point where you feel like the first three to four hours of your working day is super productive and then you get to one o'clock and you're thinking, oh, okay, awesome, I can have some food at this point here. Or you may have uh, broken your fast earlier in the day, um, but as a result of having food or your lunch break, you then come back into work and you're in like a sluggish state, your alertness is very low, very poor, and your productivity, clarity, and focus is very minimal, okay? This is why maintaining a stable level of blood sugar by refraining from overeating, continuous snacking, and frequent meals is key to productivity and clarity of mind. Okay, constant spikes and crashes in blood sugar are a significant factor in mood swings. Hypoglycemia, which is low blood sugar, in particular cause anxiety, irritability, and edginess, usually preceded by a significant drop in cognitive performance. Now, this is what you would have experienced where if you go to like a work dinner or a work lunch, for example, or you're actually just working at home and you have that lunch, that lunch break, if you conceived a heavy amount of carbohydrates or consume them, sorry, at that point, they're going to experience a degree of uh, blood sugar variation. Okay, at that point, they're potentially even hypoglycemia, as I said there, which potentially then results in anxiety, irritability, edginess, and then from there, a drop in cognitive performance. Maintaining a constant level of blood sugar reduces hunger pangs and helps achieve a stable state of alertness through the working day. Okay, so at that point, they're in more of a flow state where our work productivity is as high at eight o'clock in the morning as it is at six o'clock in the evening. Okay, so we can maintain that constant variable, and then from there, as a result of that, then produce our best working capabilities or output as such. Foods and supplements that help regulate blood sugar levels. So the effects of various foods on blood sugar levels have conventionally been described using, uh, described using the glycemic index. It represents a change in blood sugar caused by the food compared to a reference value. And you guys would have seen that at some point there where potentially at school even, where you've had a look at the, uh, the GI list from there. So for example, one of the highest on the GI list would be sugar or dextrose, sucralose, and then from there, then go down into white bread sauces, white rices, for example, and then has a uh, varying degree in regards to how it then spikes our blood sugar levels, okay? A diet of foods with a fairly low glycemic load and insulin index represents the preferred option for both health and mental alertness. Foods with a high insulin index should be consumed after exercise to replenish the glycogen reserves in, muscles, in the muscles with liver with insulin. Okay, now obviously it's being really important in regards to the way both health and also mental alertness for a business perspective in regards to achieving peak performance and a peak state, then produce our best optimal work results. Okay, the spike in blood sugar caused by a meal may be balanced with various foods and supplements, and I should highlight that in the latter list. In Western countries, for example, cinnamon is typically added to sweet desserts and baked goods that significantly raise blood sugar levels. Now, we're gonna dive into foods and spices that help balance blood sugar, and you guys can take a screenshot of this at any point. So I'll just re read out this list quickly. Cinnamon, bilberry, garlic, sour cherry, apple cider vinegar, coffee, chia, ginger, lemon, turmeric, and cacao. Okay, and dark chocolate. Now, supplements and remedies that help balance blood sugar. Chromium, vitamin D, reishi spore, which I definitely recommend for any individual who uh, actually um, believes they have spikes and troughs in regards to their mood and how they feel daily. Re reishi spore is gonna be a great product. Uh, psyllium, MCT oil, bitter melon, milk thistle, resveratrol, magnesium, panax ginseng, berberine, green tea, and coriander. Now, intermittent fasting plays a key role here in regards to regulating blood sugar. And it's something I'm gonna discuss with you guys now and that I put in place for all of my clients that I work with at a high performing level. So, intermittent fasting means fasting for a significant portion of the day. For example, 16 hours, and consuming the daily food intake during the remaining window, eating window, for example, eight hours. Okay, now the simplest way to implement this is to extend your overnight fast by skipping breakfast and enjoying the first meal of the day in the afternoon. So for example, in my context here, I then tend to enjoy my first meal of the day at two o'clock in the afternoon once I've then got the majority of my work block completed or the task which I perceive to be pushing my business further forward. Okay, in practice, intermittent fasting works well as it allows for the consumption of satisfying meals during the eating window while maintaining a moderate overall energy intake. 
For example, the consumption of food, particularly carbohydrates in the evening, significantly reduces the level of stress hormones and promotes sleep, as well as stabilizing the secretion of leptin, gherkin, and ap, ap always pronounce this incorrectly, adip on ectin. There we go. <laughs> Consuming meals later in the day, uh, in the evening, sorry, also activates the parasympathetic nervous system, calming the body and making it easier to fall asleep. So some of you will notice if you track your aura metrics that when you consume food later in the day or from there a meal which is heavy in carbohydrates, your HRV will actually then get more towards a level which is optimal. So more towards the 100 metric as opposed to it being lower or higher. Okay. Intermittent fasting may also be used to, uh, to balance the function of um nucleus so scn the regulate circadian rhythm of the body so from there if you guys are unaware of this food is a precursor to sleep and then from there also our circadian rhythm which describes our 24 hour body clock okay so from there in regards to then optimizing our sleep protocol we can then optimize our food intake based around that so a sample pattern for a person who is physically active and works at slash their office fasting overnight and delaying the first meal as much as possible is going to be ideal. So usually until sometime between 3 p.m. and 6 p.m., depending on the timing of the previous meal, okay? So from there, sticking to a window of roughly 16 hours fasting and eight hours consuming food. While fasting, drink plenty of fluids, such as mineral water, rich in minerals, and delays hunger. And hunger may be further delayed before the first meal by consuming an apple, which is rich in fiber and relatively low energy, minus 50 calories. Consuming a cucumber may also delay this hunger, okay? These are negligible calories. Now, at this point here, you can also then consume these two drinks at this point here, which would then prevent you from uh, breaking your fast, but also then prevent hunger from spiking too much. So my personal favorite being the protein rich fatty coffee. And from there, as you can see, I've listed the ingredients. So from there in regards to freshly ground coffee beans, hydrolyzed collagen protein, grass fed butter, MCT oil, and a tablespoon of vanilla. This is essentially like an adapted version of a bulletproof coffee. And it's actually my personal favorite to then stave off hunger whilst also maintaining my blood sugar levels and prevent spiking insulin at that point there. So to maintain my fast. Okay, so you can keep this coffee in a thermos and consume over an extended period of time, so four to five hours. Now, when consumed slowly, this brew can balance blood sugar levels without interfering with the ketogenic effects of fasting, which is essentially the benefit of fasting while we're trying to actually utilize our fast here. The optional collagen protein introduces a suitable amount of amino acids into the circulation without breaking the fast. And in addition, the coffee significantly increases satiety and delays hunger. You guys can also opt in for the freshly pressed green juice. My personal favorite is the protein rich fatty coffee. Uh, now you guys can take a screenshot of this as well as this video goes on. Now, how do we break our fast optimally? Your first meal should consist mainly of protein, fibrous vegetables and fat and a small amount of carbohydrates if desired. I personally wouldn't include carbohydrates in my first meal, only reason being because I know that I'm very sensitive to that consumption at that point. Um, I tend to consume all of my carbohydrates post-training at that point then, where they can be utilized best by the body and also can optimize my sleep, okay? The second and last meal consumed between 8 p.m. and 11 p.m. should include plenty of carbohydrates as well as suitable amounts of fats and proteins. When consumed close to bedtime, it can help optimize sleep. Physical exercise is often timed either at the end of the fasting period in the afternoon or after the first meal later in the evening. Okay, so in regards to how I set myself up for success with this protocol, I consume my first meal at roughly 2 p.m. Again, this is consisting mainly of protein, fibrous vegetables and fat and actually no carbohydrates on my end. And then from there, I then train in the afternoon between the time of four to six, depending on my availability and schedule with my client calls. And then from there, I then have my latter meal of the day, my second meal. Okay, so I need to consume two meals per day at roughly nine to 10. Okay, and from there, I have the bulk of my carbohydrates and the bulk of my calories in that meal. Work ergonomics and methods for working better. And I love this quote. We shape our tools and thereafter our tools shape us. What an awesome quote to carry through with this process. So what do I mean by ergonomics? If you guys haven't heard of work ergonomics, as I refer to here. So the term ergonomics is derived from the Greek word ergon and noms, work and sharing. The concept and the idea behind ergonomics are rooted in the relationship between labor and the economy. Okay, so the key question being asked when we're assessing our work ergonomics is how to make people and tools function as efficiently and safely as possible. And we can divide this into the following categories, physical, cognitive, and organizational ergonomics. Okay, now ergonomic thinking and design highlights efficiency, functionalist, and accessibility. The goal is to minimize physical, physiological, and social strain to then optimize our workflow and our state as such. The goal of ergonomics is to maintain the ability to work and function as long as possible. Again, it's being key for any individual running their own business and looking to push towards a high six figure, high seven figure, multi seven figure bracket. Okay, even eight figures. 
SOPS optimization is a key part of the high performing entrepreneur's way of assessing not only work itself, but also the best possible way of working, okay? And again, there's something I assess with all of the clients that I work with on a high level, okay? All of my consulting clients in the peak performance program. So if we were to overlook this in terms of graphic and a visual aid here, we can refer to this tool, okay? So organizational ergonomics, cognitive ergonomics, and physical ergonomics, and the variables within that bracket itself. Ergonomics and back pain, okay? So one of these uh, environmental changes being the way we work and in regards to our positioning, okay? I love this Chinese proverb, you are as old as your spine. So we can implement the following changes to optimize ergonomics when using a mobile phone, for example. Now, most of you running an online business will be using that a lot, whether it's on Slack, WhatsApp, uh, Instagram, for example, social platforms, and we can put in place the following protocols to then optimize the ergonomic of that, okay? Instead of typing, use a voice note. Avoid using a mobile phone for extended periods of time, which can be obviously really important in regards to productivity and output as well. Avoid browsing the internet and reading emails on your phone. Three, balance after using your phone, straighten your neck, relax your shoulders and breathe deeply into the diaphragm and pay continuous attention to good posture and optimize the position in which you use your phone. Prop your elbows against your body and lift the phone to eye level, as you can see in the image on the right. Now, sitting and lack of physical activity, this being something really key that I'm discussing with the majority of my clients at the moment, I can think of one in particular, I'm not gonna mention his name, um, but in regards to how we then optimize his environment and his workspace, particularly in regards to any physical pain that he's experiencing or has experienced previously, which then actually then puts him off work. Now, you guys will know if you have like an achy back or any back issues that the last thing you'll be doing is sitting down for, let's say, eight to 10 hours per day and working. Quite frankly, you're gonna feel very physically uncomfortable. That's why this is so important in regards to your work ergonomic, okay? Now, lack of physical activity is one of the singular key factors in comprehensive follow-up studies and meta-analysis regarding all-cause mortality. A low level of physical activity and excessive sitting have a domino effect that undermines health in many ways. For example, it's been found to contribute to sleep impairment. Very, very interesting there. Most individuals would never ever assess that. Now, sitting and circulation. A feather like press on the back of your hand can block a blood vessel. This is a good reminder of the delicacy of the veins. And at work, we sit on our backside and genitals, which is unfavorable for both the circulatory system and also the central nervous system itself. Okay, so essentially how we feel and function. A good seat will support the upper body by the issue itself of the muscles. The rear edge of the male pubic bone is located directly below the pelvis. So guys, really pay attention to this. To prevent the pubic bone from squashing crucial nerves and blood vessels in the genital area, men tend to unconsciously tilt their pelvis backwards when sitting. As a result, the vertebrae of the lower back settle into a position that may cause deterioration of the lumbar spine. And this being where most individuals who have back issues then tend to feel this more so, okay? Particularly in men, this is really, really important to be aware of, okay? So in regards to then compromising this, or right, sorry, in regards to then overcoming this hurdle, this challenge, we're gonna discuss this, how, how we action that further. Minimizing the risk of sitting. Keep a sitting diary or wear an activity tracker to reduce the time spent sitting. Do more work standing up and actively vary your working positions over the course of the day. So for example, in my, in my situation here, I'm working at a standing desk and I work on my standing desk for roughly six hours per day. And I stay in a more of a seated position for roughly two to four hours of the day. So very minimal in that context there, okay? Use an application that reminds of short and long breaks for computer use, again, really important. If you do sedentary work, incorporate active movement into your breaks. So in my instance here, as I said, I, I tend to use my basketball hoop. I tend to have a little dance with some music in my work breaks. And from there, as a result of that, I feel my heart rate accelerate and I feel my body feels much better as a result of that. When seated, use an adjustable saddle chair. And the diagram on the right portrays that very clearly. And move around when talking on the phone and schedule walking meetings whenever possible. That being really key too. Now, standing at work, again, a concept I just reminded you guys of. Public awareness of standing desks increased between 2005 and 2018 as the health risks of sitting were studied and discussed more widely. Standing desks facilitate working ergonomically while standing up, and lymphatic and blood circulation is improved, and according to a meta-analysis published in 2014, walking desks in particular improve the levels of post-meal blood sugar. So in this context here, I'm recording this module, or rather this YouTube video, it's now five past three. So I've just finished my fast, I've just broken my fast, I've consumed my first meal, and from there, it was primarily based on proteins, fats, and fibrous vegetables. However, in regards to optimizing my post-meal blood sugar, I'm working from a standing position. Okay, moving about as I talk. Health benefits associated with standing. Reduces the risk of developing obesity, may improve blood sugar regulation. Again, really important in regards to maintaining an optimal state of clarity, both cognitively and also physically when it comes to work. May reduce the risk of cardiovascular disease and diabetes. May reduce perceived fatigue and the tendency to suffer from back pain 
many of you will suffer from that and may improve mood energy levels and reduce neck pain i definitely definitely think this being key in regards to energy levels and also mood you feel so much better standing up moving around whilst working being in a dynamic space and situation as opposed to sitting down for multiple hours on end Again, this graphic clearly portraying how we should have set ourselves up for success when it comes to work. And I'm actually working in this exact position right now. So head and neck are balanced and in line with the torso. Shoulders are nice and relaxed, the scapula retracted. Shoulders are nice and relaxed. You kind of, you kind of stand like a T-Rex as such with the elbows tucked in, uh, forearms laid out parallel. Elbows are close to the body and bent between 90 and 120 degrees. Desktop height should be adjusted accordingly. Monitor should be around 50 to 70 centimeters from the face and slightly tilted back. Mine's exactly 55. Top of the monitor is at or just below eye level so the users do not have to tilt the head or bend up the neck up and down. And wrists and hands are straight in line and roughly parallel to the floor. Very, very simple. Now, taking breaks and eliminating distractions. This being something that most individuals that I work with or most individuals that I'm looking to work with as well as uh, moving forward, really, really struggle with. They struggle with the, the concept of taking a break away from work and actually moving away from their workspace. All of humanity's problems stem from man's inability to sit quietly in a room alone. I love, love, love that quote, okay? Taking breaks during the workday is important for the maintenance of energy levels and mental agility. I massively believe so. We're not individuals that are designed to be sitting down in a static position for, what, 10, 12, 16 hours per day. As human beings, we're designed to be moving. The mind can only process five to nine things at only one time, which is Miller's Law. The fewer disruptive similar there are, the easier it is to get on with things and produce results. Okay, this is how we're going to be eliminating distractions overall. Developing routines, improving concentration, minimizing external factors, and consciously calming one's mind all facilitate carrying out and completing various tasks. This is why it is so important to be having breaks, because our concentration will tend to fade if we tend to then skip our breaks. And also in regards to then not having a routine in place, our mind's a little bit all over the place. Okay, as you can see there, the mind can only process five to nine things at any one time. Breaks are very, very important. So we can try these cognitive ergonomic tools, things we can put in place. These are like our lowest hanging fruits as such, things we can implement immediately without any financial cost as such, and then from there have more benefit from regards to our cognitive well-being and our work, our flow. Setting the day's main goals in the morning, a one to three goals, there should be another bracket there. Not to-do lists, splitting a large project into smaller tasks, automating and outsourcing repetitive tasks. So for example, your team members, creating a recurring, a recurring tasks list, using an interval timer with preset phrases for routines, Utilizing time management methods such as the Pomodoro technique. Um, in terms of my work blocks, I tend to work for 15 minutes and have a 10 minute break in which, as I said, I'm using the basketball hoop just to have a little bit of fun. Taking regular breaks and micro breaks whilst working. Tidying the workstation before and after working. Writing down in the evening the tasks that preoccupy the mind, aka okay, a brain dump. Or from there, also planning your day in advance. Okay. Now, the law of concentration. I don't know if you guys are aware of this, but I'm going to dive into it now. Several studies indicate that humans are not good at multitasking. Switching between tasks is stressful and may reduce productivity by up to 50% according to metadata analysis. Typical people who are able to concentrate, sorry, typical people are able to concentrate and focus on one thing for approximately 10 to 15 minutes. In the flow zone, which is what we're looking to achieve when it comes to work, this time may be several times that, even hours, and concentrating on a single thing improves productivity. Okay, and again, I refer to the flow zone there. I should deep dive on that moving forward now. So in terms of then getting into a position where we're at a peak state of concentration, we can put these following steps in place. Plan task completion based on time. Plan task completion based on content. Specify a different function for each device, aka working on the computer, entertainment on the tablet, and social contacts on your phone. Schedule tasks that require concentration. So for example, in this context here, I'm recording a video module, or from there, a YouTube video. I'm, I've scheduled that. I put that in place in my daily routine. Block the use of distracting applications when you when intent to concentrate on one. Okay, so for example, if you're diving into a work block, the last thing you want to be doing is have distractions from uh, Slack, for example, your email, uh, Instagram notifications, WhatsApp notifications. Remove those applications straight away. Optimizing external factors. This is being a really, really key, important part of uh, working on your own. For example, if you're in the online space, and then from there, optimizing your cognitive ability. External factors may distract you away from the matter you are focusing on. According to a study, the work of a California office worker is interrupted as often as once every three minutes. Three minutes! Now we can follow these action items to prevent this from happening. Disable email and instant messaging notification sounds on your phone in particular, but also on your computer and your desktop. Block the use of social media applications. Disconnect the internet when the tasks do not require it. Minimize excess noise by using noise cancelling headphones. Optimize your air temperature, oxygen level and purity and humidity. 
and use optimal indirect full spectrum light that is similar to daylight in order to optimize our body's function and minimize unnecessary human contact that impairs your ability to work, okay? So from there, choosing what to work in maybe such a social space as such in order to then make sure we can optimize our work capability and cognitive function again. Now, indoor air quality, this is a variable that most individuals definitely, definitely do not even assess nor think about and the significance of it. In terms of external factors, creating optimal indoor climates is the single most important factor in improving the working conditions of knowledge workers. Now, we spend more than 90% of our time indoors and breathe roughly 12 to 15 ki kilograms of indoor air per day. That's a ton. Now, studies suggest that poor indoor air quality has a significant impact on cognitive abilities and alertness. Poor indoor air quality may indeed make our stomach. According to a study conducted on test subjects, the individuals tested received significantly lower cognitive test results when tested in a poorly ventilated building. Poor indoor air quality is a predisposing factor for respiratory infections, poisoning, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, cardiovascular diseases, lung cancer, and asthma. So in my context here, I have my apartment space, which looks over the River Thames. And from there, I open up my, my doors on, on the balcony for at least four hours a day to ensure that my air quality is of high quality, okay? Actions for improving air quality. Wipe off dust on a regular basis, refrain from smoking indoors. You shouldn't be smoking by any means, but in terms of people around you in that environment, refrain from that from happening. Swap detergents for the safest alternatives possible, such as vinegar. Favor unscented detergents and personal hygiene products. If necessary, have the indoor quality analyzed, okay, by a specialist. Ventilate your home frequently, 20 minutes per day. Purchase an air purifier, a key, key purchase right there. Purchase an air freshener that increases air humidity. Use ozone treatments to remove unpleasant odors. Purchase an ionizer that spreads ions into the air, trapping negatively charged particles. Again, that not necessarily, not necessarily being such a, a lowest hanging fruit variable we can control there, that would cost uh, a fair amount, financially speaking. Um, just be aware of that. Purchase plants that purify indoor air, and the following plants are recommended by NASA. Snake plant, Barberton daisy, um, again, I'm gonna butcher this pronunciation, uh, chrysanthemums, and a peace lily, okay? So again, majority of these variables here in terms of improving air quality being lowest hanging fruit, we can focus on without too much financial investment. Obviously, something like an ionizer being a little bit more heavy on that regard. Calming the mind, a question I get asked a ton by the individuals that I work with. We can use the following tools to calm your mind. Music, classical music, classical ambient sounds, nature sounds, solfeggio frequencies, binaural beats, and isochronic tones, okay? Now, calming the mind being really important, both in regards to, for example, HRV metrics, but also in regards to then obviously optimizing our state of flow in our work, and also the way we interact with other individuals, and then from there push forward in regards to work tasks and action items, okay? Sense and aromatherapy, lavender, rosemary, lemon, jasmine, ced cedarwood, uh, peppermint, chamomile, and frankincense incense. Okay, and then from there also using a spike mat, which actually boosts oxytocin and endorphins. I'm currently standing on my own. Finally, yoga, massage, and stretching boost circulation throughout the body and the brain, minimizing sensory stimuli, so sensory deprivation, using an isolation tank, silence exercises, and deep breathing into a diaphragm. Okay, now these all being tools which can calm your mind on a daily basis. Flow, how we get into the optimal state of flow with work. I love, love, love this quote. You know what you need to do is possible to do. Even though difficult and sense of time disappears, you forget yourself and you feel part of something larger. That is an awesome description of what flow is. Now, flow is a term coined by Hungarian-born psychologist Mahalai, I might pronounce his last name, I'm just gonna butcher it, <laughs> to describe the mental state of being in harmony with the information processed by the consciousness as well as one's own goal. And you guys will have all experienced that at some point if you come from an athletic background where you felt like you're in a sense of flow, you're unbeatable, you're indestructible, and hopefully you've actually had that in terms of context with your work as well. It's a time of peak emotion and performance. A flow is also called the optimal experience. A person experiencing flow is so focused on one singular thing that everything else is shut outside the consciousness. The opposite of flow is psychological entropy, meaning a disarray of the human consciousness. In this state, the information processed by the consciousness conflicts with the intentions, and in physiological entropy, the, the focus is on the irrelevance, making it difficult to fulfill these intentions. Okay? So, many top athletes have described experiencing flow or being in the zone during record-breaking athletic performances. Usain Bolt being one of them when he's breaking his world records. I'm sure other individuals like, for example, Federer and Nadal, they often refer to being in the zone when playing their best tennis. Scientists have determined that the state of flow involves a temporary decrease in activity in the frontal area of the brain. As a result, the neutrons of the basal ganglia lights up with greater efficiency. Thus, the analytical part of the brain is put on hold while the creative sensorimonitor 
part takes center stage, okay? So the top priority for work efficiency is to conjure up inspiration. Flow is the result of continuously doing the things that make us feel meaningful and cause us to push the limits of our skills. In this context here, myself recording this video, being in a peak state in regards to my work and controlling my variables, I feel like I'm in a, in a, in a flow state. I feel like I'm not necessarily thinking about anything uh, externally speaking in regards to social factors, in regards to friends, family, other objects in my life or other items in my life. Um, but from there, I feel like I'm very much focused on the task at hand because I'm in a state of flow. And according to the author, Stephen Kotler, the king of flow can be divided into four categories. Psychological factors, environmental factors, social factors, and creative factors. And we're going to break this down. Psychological triggers for being in a flow state. Concentrating intensively on one task at a time without interruptions. A clearer goal or objective. Immediate feedback that facilitates improving performance in real time. And the optimal ratio between challenge and skills. Okay, so especially the key variable here for myself in regards to a psychological trigger is definitely concentrating intensely on one task. So from there, for example, um, in my morning work blocks, I tend to work from a period of 10 till 2 after I've then trained email and trained myself as well, in case one of my high performing clients there. Um, I then tend to focus on one task, which is going to move the business further forward and concentrate intensively on that task without any interruption of those four, that four hour period. As a result of that, I feel like I'm very much in a state of flow. Environmental triggers. Potential serious consequences of failure, aka being in a survival situation, a rich environment with plenty of new factors, surprises and uncertainty, and a deep state of embodiment. And a creative trigger would be identifying repeating patterns such as color, shape, data, movement, sound, concepts, risks, failures, etc. Taking a risk and having the courage to present new ideas. In regards to creative triggers, one being key for myself is the aroma or rather the smells in, in my work environment and also in terms of the, the sounds and also the, the brightness of the room itself in terms of the variables that I've controlled. Now, social triggers. A deeply shared state of concentration, uh, which is obviously identifiable in team sports. Clear goals shared by the group. Effective communication amongst the group. A shared common factor such as language, or from there in regards to be working on a certain skill set or a certain niche. A shared skill level and group participation. A risk associated with the task boosts motivation and creativity. The feeling of control regarding the task, the combination of autonomy and competence and the ability to present and listen and being open to new experiences and able to say yes. These are all social triggers which will get you into a heightened state of flow. So monitoring and measuring the work environment and the ways of which we are working. How do we quantify this? Again, quantifying all of the above in terms of the variables I've discussed can be very, very important. In other words, we can't further improve it nor assess the variables which, which are not necessarily handling optimally. It'd be like saying we want to improve our bank account without actually looking about how much money is in our bank account. Very, very simple analogy there, but very, very clear and uh, transparent as well. Okay, so monitoring and measuring the work environment and ways of working. Sitting, standing, walking and running. We can assess the time and distance. Posture, hours per day, maintaining good posture. So for example, I'm working standing right now. Heart rate and blood pressure throughout the day. Heart rate, systolic and diastolic pressure. Blood sugar, how we test that. Indoor air quality, lighting, tested in lumens, noise decibels, temperature, Celsius or Fahrenheit, mood. Again, that'd be more self-reflective as such in regards to a rating of maybe one to three or one to 10. Innovation, aka reaction time. Test measuring cognitive performance. Breaks, amount of rest, exercise. Time spent using a computer. An analysis that I make daily for myself and my clients. Efficient working, studying, interaction, time wasting. Um, time spent on the phone, minutes per day. Really, really important there. Stress and recovery, heart rate variability, which is tracked by Aura. And then from there, put into my dashboard for my clients. And then sleep quality, again, trapped by myself and my team as well, okay? So these are all important metrics we need to be assessing and variables to be assessing in regards to monitoring and measuring the way we're working in our environment and what's optimal for us. So what's worth measuring depends on what's being worked on and the skills being developed. Overall, for office-based work, it is more relevant in terms of health to measure the proportion of standing time to sitting time than to count steps, of course. Indoor air quality is more useful than noise or lighting. By monitoring one's nervous system function and cognitive performance, the high-performing entrepreneur is able to pinpoint the part of the day during which he or she is at his or her most efficient to perform various tasks, okay? Again, really important in regards to the timing, the things that are going to move our business further forward and how we then put that in place on a daily basis. Blood sugar measurements may yield information about fatigue-inducing blood sugar swings and facilitate adjustments to eating habits to make them more balanced, okay? Because again, we want to keep ourselves in a neutral state in regards to our blood sugars without any waves and spikes in order to maintain cognitive function, obviously physical function too. Really, really important things in terms of business. Measuring mood, stress and recovery are of interest to many looking to fine tune one's personal workload. And time spent using a computer in relation to time spent using a mobile or sleeping may in itself speak volumes about one's sleep-wake cycle. 
again, an assessment I very much make daily with my clients too. Uniform for success. So in regards to the variables we need to be establishing or being aware of in terms of system, we need to be assessing all of these variables to then reach an optimal state of work and flow. Meaningful work, what it is, how we then obviously put that into place daily, regulating our blood sugars, intermittent fasting, work ergonomics and methods for working better, flow, your optimal experience of work, and monitoring and measuring the work environments and ways of working. All of these variables being variables I've discussed with you guys earlier on in this video, okay? Really, really important we assess these and action these in regards to making sure they then further improve. So here's the thing. One of the most immediate and impactful things you can do to enhance your daily performance, optimize the quality and method of your work, is to create a good environment and system. Hacking high performance is simple, but not easy. Success happens when the right things get done. And knowing what the right things requires mental clarity. But identifying the right things to do isn't enough. You need to do them. It's like having the amazing, most amazing car to drive a race, but without having petrol for that car, okay? We can have the right business strategy and obviously the right mental analysis in regards to what we need to do to move forward with our business. But if you guys can't fuel that performance by controlling your environment and enhancing your daily performance, you cannot then push forward in that business, okay? Execution requires time, energy, focus, and endurance. This is why you must think of yourself as a system that has to be optimized. Hence, all the work that I do with my clients. High performance and optimal workflow requires four key things. Apologies for the spelling mistake there. Biological, mental, environment, and system assessment, and also then performance, okay? Now, the above four variables are all interconnected, making the mistake of thinking that they are separate will lead to a decline in your performance and quality of work, okay? Now, again, assessing all of these systems here, as I just referred to in the last slide, super, super important in regards to having a uniform for success we can carry forward with business and fueling ourselves in regards to obviously then pushing forward the strategies we have for business with mental clarity, okay? So, so incredibly important. I hope you guys enjoyed today's video. If you have any questions, please put them in the comment section below or send me a message on Instagram or Facebook and I look forward to recording our video for next week.